Run that you may obtain. Words taken from our epistle today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is now time to make a penance plan for Lent. Today we will consider our motives for such penance with a view towards justice. First, we ought to call to mind the distinction between guilt and punishment due sin. The guilt due sins and their eternal punishment is absolved in sacramental confession. But as the sacred council of Trent teaches, not all of the temporal punishment due to our sins is thereby remitted. The rest we make up by performing the sacramental penance imposed upon us by the priest, as well as by voluntary penances, like those we do during Lent. These penances make real satisfaction for the temporal punishment due our sins, which, if not accomplished in this life, will be waiting for us to do in purgatory. We ought, therefore, to take these next couple weeks before Lent and plan what penances we will do during Lent. How many times since this last year, or even longer, have we found ourselves to be overindulgent in our bodies, or in our speech, or in our thoughts? How often have we made those little exceptions here and there? We have gone to confession, been freed from the guilt, but how much debt of punishment has been slowly accruing? And hasn't this growing debt perhaps weighed us down, caused us more readily to sin, made us slower in the exercise of prayer, slower in our growth and virtue? We have done penances for these things, sure, but perhaps those little payments we've been making have only taken off some of the interest, but the debt keeps growing. You can make payments on your credit card while the debt still increases. In fact, that is a good example. Sometimes you're you're living on a very tight budget, you have nagging debts, and you think to yourself, if I could only just not spend any money for a couple months, I'd get out from under this. Well, spiritually speaking, Lent is a great time to do just that, to make a vigorous effort to pay off that debt that's been accruing silently in the background. It's time to undereat for all those times we've overeaten. It's time to mortify our tongue or social media account with silence for our boastings and gossip. It's time to pray more than we have to to make up for all those times we prayed less than we ought. It's time to disturb our sleep for our laziness to discomfort our bodies for an excessive love of comfort, to take in less entertainment. Abstaining entirely from alcohol, sweets, or other luxuries of that nature, these are good things. Corporal penances, in fact, can count for less tangible offenses. How about combating pride? Hard to do. Some ways, plain attire. If you're a woman, giving up makeup and jewelry. In all things, be creative and be rigorous. Nor should we forget giving more to charity, which we know covers a multitude of sins. It's always a good idea, if you are able, to give double what you normally do, especially if you are thereby able to use any money that you save on those luxuries you've given up. And you say, well, that sounds like a lot. You want us to use the hair shirt and the discipline too, perhaps? My best advice to you is this. Go big this Lent. Run so as to win, not just to place, not just for that participation trophy. Don't just do one thing, do many. Do some that are secret, known only to yourself. Some that are public, things that cannot escape other people's notice. Do some for just the 40 days of Lent, taking Sundays off as a break, but do some for all of the 46 days from the start of Lent until Easter. 
Now we may be tempted to say, but if I have my sins already forgiven, and if it's the same punishment anyway, why not just wait until purgatory? Our sufferings undertaken in this life will be much easier to bear than those that await us in purgatory. Christ revealed to St. Bridget, while there is still time, meditate carefully on the page of mercy, for all who are saved will be cleansed either by water or by fire, that is, either by a small amount of penance in the present time, or by the fire of purgatory in the future, until they are purged. Consider this example. There were two men, each who, being angered at an insult given, punched his neighbor in the face. They are caught, cited, and given a court date, a couple weeks from the incident. They are both sorry for what they have done and intend to submit themselves to the judge for their sentence. And one of them considers this sufficient. He is sorry. He will go to the court and then receive whatever sentence the judge gives him. Perhaps, though, he thinks that the judge will be lenient. Maybe he will have forgotten. Time has passed. And he will just give him a slap on the wrist. But the other does not wait for sentencing before he punishes himself. He mortifies himself before his neighbor. He gives him money and serves him. He treats him with greater kindness and respect than anyone else. What will the judge say when both men, both sorry, come before him? Surely he will see the great depth of contrition that the second man had. He will see that he wasted no time in doing penance. He will see that this man has already suffered enough even if it was but a few weeks, and there is no need to give him any more punishment. But what will he say to the first man? He is contrite, yes, but he has waited to receive his punishment from the judge himself, and so he punishes him severely. He is sent to jail for many years, sent to hard labor, to to be released eventually, true, but not for a long time, much, much longer than the first man labored to serve the one he insulted. Perhaps you say, that sounds too extreme. He who purifies himself from his faults in the present life, says St. Catherine of Genoa, satisfies with a penny a debt of a thousand ducats, and he who waits until the other life to discharge his debts consents to pay a thousand ducats for what he might before have paid with a penny. If you owed a debt that you could pay with five dollars now or five thousand tomorrow, which would you choose? If you could choose between taking forty cold showers this Lent or forty thousand after you die, which will be easier? Now, why is there such a difference? Which is of more value? Which reveals greater depth of contrition, imposing penance upon oneself with one's full will, or waiting and then receiving it as a suffering imposed upon us from without? Or we might think of this positively. Which is of greater value? A husband who gives his wife flowers on their anniversary because it is expected and he'll get in trouble if he doesn't, or a husband who gives his wife flowers simply because he loves her. There is more than this. By choosing to suffer now, we choose to suffer while we still have free use of our will, which means we can learn from our suffering, learn from our penances. The penances we apply to ourselves in this life will then act as a deterrent. Yes, it is good to wish to avoid sin so as not to suffer in the next life, but by our sufferings in this life, knowing full well that we have brought them upon ourselves, 
We feel the pain our sins have caused. We thus deepen our contrition for our sins, and by doing so, we are less likely to commit them again. Consider again the case of the two men we mentioned above. Who is more likely to repeat the offense? The man who quickly mortified himself, or the one who delayed such mortification? The latter one submits to justice, but the one who quickly mortified himself grew in charity. Charity is necessary for any and every good we do. Charity lasts forever. So again, go big. Run so as to win, not just to place, not just to get that coveted participation trophy. Don't go easy on yourself this Lent. Make your plan now. Start getting ready, getting excited for it. If you are hard to motivate quickly, well, that's why the Church gives us a good two and a half weeks. So take this time and really motivate yourself. This is a great opportunity. It's your great chance to do exactly what our Lord tells us to settle with our adversary on the way to the judge before the judgment is rendered. One final note. We have spoken of the importance of mortification, but there are other very efficacious means of expiating temporal punishment due our sins. Pious reception of the sacraments, indulgences, devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and wearing of her scapular, but most importantly, Charity towards the living and the dead. I wanted to list our devotion to our Blessed Mother as the last and most effectual, and indeed, such true devotion to her is really the most efficacious. But there is easily present a sort of showy devotion to Mary, like a lot of other forms of showy piety, that lack charity towards one's neighbor. Just as one can undertake bodily penances, and also be devoid of charity. This is in no way to undercut anything we have said of the good of mortification, or the rigor with which we should afflict ourselves during this coming Lent. But we must always remember the admonition of St. Paul. If I should distribute all my goods to feed the poor, and if I should deliver my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Thus, we must keep an eye on ourselves. Go big for Lent, yes, please, but only in charity. If the penances you undertake hinder your exercise of charity, then they benefit you not, but only swell your pride. Fasting can make one more irritable and impatient. See that you mortify your irritability and impatience as well. Be hard and demanding with yourselves this Lent, but be kind and charitable to your neighbor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.